we've heard this morning a lot about the opportunities um, and how we have a real capacity today to find more answers. Um, and I want to dig back a little bit and pose some questions and some questions about the questions we ask ourselves. Um, because I think with all of these opportunities in front of us, we've forgotten um, some of the important aspects of what it is we're actually trying to achieve. I actually started off um, my undergraduate degrees in chemistry and, and, and biochemistry. I then moved into technology and policy development. I'm now actually in the humanities. Um, I actually work in a cultural science department at Curtin University in Western Australia. And as one of my colleagues, my international colleagues, Dan O'Donnell, likes to say, the thing about the sciences is that it answers problems. What the humanities does is problematizes answers. And that's what I really want to try and do today uh, by focusing on the questions, how we ask them or what we're doing when we do that. So this was sort of the exam question we were set for today. How does excellence in innovation lead to economic growth or productivity or, or a range of other things? But that was kind of the context we were set. And how does openness and collaboration contribute to that? But I don't, I will come back to openness and collaboration. I want to focus on this word to start with. Because we've heard this word a lot this morning. We hear it a lot in the context of research and innovation. So what do we mean when we use this word? So I want to focus on the, its use in the context of research and publicly funded research in publicly funded, largely, institutions. And one way to look is to look for this word in the context of mission statements of various universities around the world. So here's one from the University of Queensland. This is a, a common sort of theme that we strive for excellence. The University of San Diego pursues excellence. Um, my own university strives again for both excellence and a distinction. Cape Peninsula University of Technology, this is a relatively new university in um, South Africa. They prize excellence. The University of Westminster demands it. <laughs> and of course, there are institutions that express this with a little bit more confidence. They're just assuming that it's already there. This is Princeton that already obviously has world-class excellence across all of its departments. The University of Edinburgh is a world-leading centre of academic excellence. Note, no one's defined what it is. It's just a target. University of Maryland has an interesting statement. It talks about the way that diversity is integral to the mission of excellence. So this is interesting in that it sets up a different characteristic of the institution as important in delivering this thing, whatever it is. And I think that's something I want to come back to, that question of diversity and excellence, homogeneity and excellence. But we're never closer to understanding what we're talking about, right? Excellence in what? So again, looking through some of these, uh, the University of Westminster is a traditionally teaching institution. It's focused on excellence in professionally relevant teaching. You see this formulation a lot, excellence in research and education, excellence in research education, knowledge exchange, something new, also public engagement from Cornell University. Again, going back to my own university, excellence in teaching and research, but also leadership and innovation in those things as well. Teaching, research, but again, what are the characteristics of excellent teaching and research? Other institutions actually do talk about other things that are also excellent. Here, the University of Toledo describes itself as a center of excellence for cultural, athletic, and other events. Indiana University, interestingly, goes quite deep and talks about the excellence of its IT infrastructures. And sometimes you see this sort of a particular sense that an institution feels it's good at something and wants to talk about that. But we're still no closer to what we understand, we, what we mean. Maybe we can think about determining or identifying or measuring excellence. So Indiana says that their schools are recognised for their excellence through peer comparisons, national and international. 
those, those, again, the choice of international excellence versus national excellence is something that plays out in the sense an institution has of itself. University of Missouri gives us something that's a little bit more contextual, a little bit more local, um, being satisfied with the highest goals that we can envision, that excellence is something we determine, is something that we set our own targets. And they also go on to talk about regional, national and global standards, but it'll come back to that point of personal expectations. So excellence means many different things. It can apply to teaching and research and education and scholarship and sports facilities. It can be the result of diversity. It can be the result of publications. It can be the result of the people that you've brought in from outside the institution or the people you engage with in the community. Probably the most important piece of sociology on excellence in research is the work of Michelle Lamont. And she starts her book, How Professors Think, with this sentence, excellence is the holy grail of academic life. She then proceeds to spend the rest of the book saying no one agrees what it means. <laughs> that it's produced and defined in a multitude of sites by an array of different actors. Jack Stilgo, in somewhat more polemic mode, in his essay against excellence, says it tells us nothing about how important the science is and everything about who gets to decide how important it is. The locus of excellence is more placed in the person doing the evaluation, the system doing the evaluation, than it is necessarily in any characteristic of the teaching, the research, the public engagement or the sports facilities that are being examined. I go one further than that. I think when we use the word excellence, it's a way of avoiding a rather difficult conversation. It's a way of using a word that could mean anything to anyone, so it means nothing. And the conversation we're avoiding is talking about values. Let me try and illustrate that with a diagram which is always a good way to illustrate something. What do we do research for, or innovation for, or creativity for? We do it for many different things. We've heard a lot about looking for economic outcomes out of research. We've heard a little bit about the wish for it to enrich culture, to improve the environment, to improve our health either individually or as part of a population. Talked a little bit less about its role in, in education and, and informing a wider public. And actually the thing we haven't interestingly touched on is the importance of research in supporting further research itself, which is always, I find, an interesting thing for it to be left out and hived off. These are all different things. They have very different outcomes. I put excellence in the middle of that and pretend that applies to all of these different things. I'm not actually saying anything. I could put other words there. Here's one that gets used quite a lot. There's another one. Maybe this one <coughs> runs some of the same risks. What links these things together is the activity that leads to them, not any qualities of the outcomes themselves. We do not live in a black and white or even a grey world. We live in a world of different outcomes where different people are looking for very different things. What we're trying to do is ask the question, how can we optimise the process the research enterprise that is leading to these different outcomes. What we're asking is a question about evaluation. How do we evaluate how well the systems we use to fund, support, manage, deliver and communicate research lead to the outcomes that you care about or I care about or the government of Denmark cares about, or the government of Portugal cares about. And we will have different answers 
to that question because we will be asking different questions of how we want the world to change. Barbara Hernstein Smith is to me one of the, the most interesting people thinking about evaluation. And in her book, Contingencies of Value, she says what are we doing when we evaluate something is making a value judgment of a work, articulating an estimate of how well that work will serve some implicitly defined function for an implicitly defined audience, experiencing the work under implicitly defined conditions. When we use the word excellence, we're avoiding the hard job of making those implicits explicit. And that's a problem because these are political questions about the disposition of resources and who benefits from those disposition of resources, about the design of institutions and systems that drive the innovation, the creativity and the knowledge creation of our societies. There is some good news. <laughs> it's not all bad. Um, not quite all bad. We used to live in a world where trying to understand what happened after someone did research was like going out in a trail and looking for the marks that someone had very specifically left behind when they were walking around. There was a very simple and single mechanism we had to understand how research was being communicated and used, and that was fundamentally the act of citation, when a researcher recognised the contribution that another researcher had made to their work. As Jason Prem says in a wonderful analogy, it's like we were trying to follow these trails over a rock filled landscape and there's been a snowfall. As the world has moved online, now there are traces of virtually every interaction that anyone has with a piece of information. There are tracks of all sorts of different processes occurring, all sorts of different interactions, uses, involvement, criticism, argumentation, and questioning. Now we have to be careful these are the tracks and traces, they're not the events themselves. And we also have to be careful because of the privacy, publicity, and potential bias issues that arise from manipulating and using these traces. But nonetheless, they are there. So if we go back to this diagram where we were trying to understand how the process in the middle of research and scholarship leads to these outcomes on the outside, we now have all of these signals of processes that are going on. Flares that light up, LEDs on a circuit board that appear when something happens, when someone looks at a piece of research, a download is registered. When someone downloads a data set, there's a record of that event. When someone talks about it on Twitter, there's a record of that event. And perhaps we can start to think about actually for the first time, understanding the processes by which our communication of research is or is not reaching the right places, going down the right pathways to reach those places where it has outcomes in culture, in technology, in economics, in education, as well as in further research. But data also causes a problem. Let me illustrate that by focusing on just this one traditional concern that we've had. How does research turn into future research? How do we determine the influence, value and effectiveness of a particular piece of research? Now, in the past, as I said, we only had this one particular piece of information, a citation. That was the only thing that we could see. And today, Maybe someone bookmarks that paper on, a, on some sort of social media service. Um, perhaps we can see a conversation amongst authors about questioning an aspect of the work that happens earlier in that process. Maybe and this is not just about social media and digital downloads, it's also potentially about the information that arises from the fact that two people were at the same conference. That might be a signal that there's a higher potential for their collaboration. They might have co-authored articles in the past, there might be an existing record of their interaction and collaboration. We have all of these signals to look at this path. Now remember, and this is the problem, 
What we're seeking is to maximize the capacity for future production of research. We do that through optimizing the flow of knowledge and innovation through this pathway we imagine. And we optimize that pathway by being able to manipulate the research enterprise itself by the tools we choose to evaluate, the way we choose to evaluate researchers, the communication systems we choose to put in place, the policies about open access and open data. But the observable universe looks like this. We have signals, proxies. In fact, it's worse than that. This is the only thing we pay attention to. And I'm being slightly over provocative, and I'll, I'll row that back a little bit. But our entire research enterprise has been optimized, worked on, policy developed, policy implemented on the basis of this single signal. That has become what excellence is. And remember, the world looks like this. This is the set of opportunities that were laid out for you this morning in terms of the possible ways in which we could change the world. And instead, we focus on this one single data point. Now, someone, some of you will be thinking, and some of you heard me speak about this two years ago, actually, but no, we're adding extra data points now. We're bringing in more of these. We're adding this piece of information or that piece of information. But think about the characteristics of that. Think about what that process is saying. We're just adding one other number, and they're usually numbers. And that leads us into the problem, because the combination of not actually being able to talk about what excellence is, using it as an excuse to not talk about what matters to us, and having numbers leads us to scales and rankings. And those become the targets. If this is the world that we would like to be working with, like to be seeing, when we focus on a small set, when we make excellence productivity of research outputs or number of citations or H index or whatever it is, downloads, tweets, grant income, we homogenize that top part of the circle. So when the commissioner today said, look, Horizon 2020 is great because the commission doesn't take a role, the experts in the commission don't decide which projects get funded. He then went on to say, oh, but we send that off to another bunch of experts with their own, our own. I've sat in those panels, I've judged your proposals. Our own narrow sense, homogeneous sense, driven by these traditional measures, these traditional approaches. And if we fund just the very top, just the top 5%, if we only elect the top 5% to national academies, if we only focus our attention on that top 5%, then an interesting thing happens. We get a focus on that, on the signals, on the proxies, not on what it is we're looking for. And I'm as guilty of this as the next person. This is a line from the CV I submitted in a fellowship application a month ago to the Australian Research Council, where I had to pick my 10 best research outputs and then justify why I picked them. Why do, how do I justify this? Oh, lots of citations. Even when I'm trying to present something that is a non-traditional output, I'm still using a numeric. So it's 2,500 views. Is that good? Anyone, you know, is that good or is that bad in, in this context? For what purpose? The hilarious one is this one. So this is, in a sense, the article of the talk I'm giving that we released as a preprint a couple of weeks ago. Um, colleagues Dan O'Donnell, Martin Eve, Damien Patterson, Samuel Moore, about how we shouldn't be focusing on excellence and numerical metrics. And what happens? We get lots of downloads. I, it's actually up to 31,000 now, just in case you were wondering. So because excellence doesn't mean anything, because it has to mean everything, 
And because we turn it into something that can be put on a scale as a result of that, it becomes a performance and we get a performance of excellence in the place of excellent performance. And I'm not going to rehearse all the arguments about reproducibility, about fraud, about the lack of public engagement, about the lack of quality software development in academia. I'm not even going to sort of illustrate that the reason why academics are not good at talking to industry is because we have very different <laughs> sets of senses about what it is we're trying to achieve because we've so much internalised this story. All of those examples, all of those problems you've already heard about in many places over the last several years. But for me, the thing that links them is the way that this narrative, and it's our narrative as a research community. A lot of you sitting out there with pursed lips because I'm attacking this very deeply held sense of what we are. We are the people who have made it through university, through graduate school, through the problems of postdocs into tenured positions, who've been successful in gaining grants, in getting publications, in being elected to the right committees, to being on the right boards. It's really difficult to turn that around and say, oh, yeah, actually, I just fit into that particular box, don't I? That doesn't necessarily make me objectively good. That's quite a hard thing to swallow. So what's the answer? Well, to me, the answer is to change the narrative. I'm going to offer a way of doing this, and you're probably not going to like it, but I'm going to argue for it. Um, but I don't have any answers, to be honest. I'm only bringing you questions and asking you to ask those questions better. So the narrative I want to focus on is one of soundness. Is the idea of inverting our whole sense of what makes good research. The problem with excellence, the problem with this focus and narrowing to the top, the apex of this triangle, is that it homogenises practice. It homogenises the kind of things that we're concerned about, the kind of things that are awarded and celebrated. And yet we, that's what we try and select for and we tell governments and funders that we're selecting for when we select this top 5%. We only fund the best, right? What if we turned that around and said, OK, now let's just redistribute the funding to everything that's OK. We set a floor, we set a basis, a platform for us to work above. We create an infrastructure system on which creativity of different types can then be explored. Now, objection number one, but we've got scarce resources. We can't afford to, to not focus our resources in a particular place. Except we're living in an era of historically high research and development expenditure. The world has never spent more money on research and development than it is at the moment. And yet we keep telling ourselves there's no money. It's a really interesting narrative to pick apart. And yes, there are obviously there are regional differences and you've had cuts here in Denmark and we've certainly had cuts in the UK. But those are cuts in the context of historically very high spending in absolute terms. And we heard actually it's not really about money, it's about people. You know, the money is time, it's not the, really the other way around. And the number of researchers in the world is rising you know, cont continuously over the last 20 years. And yes, a lot of that's in China and India, um, but it's also a lot of that's happening um, in the Western world. So that's argument number one. Argument number two is one about actually evaluation and the quality of our evaluative techniques. Again, I'm not going to belabor the point by bringing out the bibliography. There is very strong evidence that we are terrible at recognizing excellence. Interrater comparisons, a whole range of studies. Again, to Jack Stilgo's point, when you look at whether two people agree on whether a work or a person or an institute is excellent, that tells you more about the two people than it does about the institute. Whereas we're actually pretty good at determining what reaches our minimum standards. We can actually be fairly clear about what is 
properly done methodology. And there's still a lot of social construction in there, to be fair, but it's more straightforward. So there's a problem, there's a really fundamental problem with assuming we can find that top 5% or 10% and resource it, even aside from the issue of homogeneity. The other is this has worked. The two biggest innovations in the scholarly communication space in the last 30 years in the early 90s, the physics preprint archive, Paul Ginsberg creates a space where any researcher in the space of high energy physics can post a manuscript of their article before or as they submit it to a journal. This has revolutionized the way physics in those spaces is done and mathematics and to a large extent computer science as well, or parts of those disciplines. Whole systems and infrastructures are built on this system which, unlike the journal hierarchy which we're used to operating in, has a very base level of checks for admission. And yes, that pushes the burden of assessing and deciding whether a piece of work is useful to you, particularly to the reader to a certain extent, but frankly, so does the journal system at the end of the day. Plus one, whether or not you like it as a journal, whether or not you agree with that editorial criteria in terms of the pursuit of excellence, has utterly changed the economics of scholarly publishing. It has changed what is possible by shifting the editorial criteria for inclusion in a journal from is this interesting enough for this journal to is this sound science? a shift enabled by online publishing and the capacities of the internet and the lack of issues with um, physical, page chart, physical page limits. But both of these are stories where a rhetoric, a narrative about soundness has been transformational. You may not like the transformation. Maybe that's something to discuss in the questions or, or over drinks but it changes the capacity of the system in ways that you might not otherwise expect. Finally, the final argument I want to make is one of infrastructure's capacities. It seems strange to make an argument for redistribution and focus on soundness in this space, but in other spaces it makes a lot of sense. We don't say, let's build the internet in Paris. We say, Let's build a communication infrastructure that's integrated and works as far as is possible across Europe. And maybe you decide that the last 5% of Denmark at the top of the Ødersund, which is really expensive to lay fibre to, doesn't deliver those kinds of benefits. But you're looking for the 5% where it isn't cost effective, not the 5% where you can make more money off it. You don't restrict education to only those people who can afford it. In this country in particular, you provide it as a platform which creates an educated population, which then delivers in terms of tax and creativity and innovation over the course of their life, as we heard last night at dinner. And these systems where we're happy with redistribution and infrastructure provision have an interesting thing in common. They're often networked. They're often publicly provided and publicly resourced. But they're things that create capacity at scale and they're things that create capacity for a wide range of unexpected outcomes and innovations. Does that sound like research? to you, a platform on which people can build things, on which people can do the unexpected, which means we need to, as the Commissioner said this morning, get away from the idea that we already have the answers and provide the capacity and space that lets creative people, people supported by the appropriate platforms, deliver that innovation. And I'm not going to talk much about open science or open access or open data. Again, I did this Two years ago, many of you were in the room for that, for that panel. But the successful platforms are also open platforms. They're the ones that are neutral to access, that enable people to come in, enable the unexpected person, organisation, collaboration to develop and innovate. 
And again, if this is a question of evaluation, I think I may have duplicated my slides here, we have to ask the question whether we can tell. We have to evaluate our own evaluative capacities. So can we change this system where we search for this top? And if you believe my argument, then by creating this narrowing at the top and searching for it, we are necessarily homogenizing what is done and what can be built on it. Can we focus on building platforms that support innovation of a range of different types? Can we support a much more questioning approach to what it is that we want to deliver so that the patient can become involved in the process of determining the course of their treatment, but also determining the course of the research and the importance of the research that's driving their condition. I heard a story many years ago, and I'll get this no doubt slightly wrong, there was a, an, an autoimmune disease where the research had really focused on treating the um, antibody count amongst, the, um, amongst patients. That was their, their clinical marker. That was what they focused on. They were trying to bring this down. Millions and millions of dollars of research going into this area. They actually asked the patients what they thought their disease was. And they thought it was a bowel condition because their experience of it was bowel problems, was having to go to the toilet constantly. Much easier to treat, much cheaper to treat the conditions that were of the concern to the patient group, if you ask the right question of the right person. And that requires trust. And so I want to close by bringing up the elephant in the room. So from my accent, you'll detect that I'm a native Australian. Um, I'm affiliated with an Australian university. I actually live in the UK. And this issue of what questions we're asking, to me, seems to be right at the core of what is going wrong at the moment. Referendums are a very easy way of providing an answer. What the hell was the question? Because lots of people were asking very different questions with very different motivations when they put that cross on the ballot paper. They were doing it without information. So the flows that I'm trying to articulate that we could measure of the knowledge of the experts so summarily dismissed as unimportant could reach those people and they could test and question and engage with those experts and that authority. We have failed to do that completely. We have failed to listen to that group, groups. And, and it's particularly this group. We are the European academic elite assembled in this beautiful symbol of European economic success and a particular social construction of that success. Something wrong with the fact that I'm the person being provocative and asking questions when I'm a white male, middle-aged, fairly wealthy Anglophone. <laughs> so what can we do to address those questions? Because we must address them. We need to know and engage and be much more deeply developed. We need to take the benefits, the economic benefits and technological benefits that have arisen over the past 10 years, the benefits and the abundance that we have, and we need to find ways of distributing that more effectively and making people feel like it's been distributed more effectively. And we have to provide the social and economic platforms that allow those people to be creative and engage and ask their questions of the creativity and the innovation that we can provide. So I will finish by coming back to this. I think we've been asking the wrong question. The question is not whether our research is excellent, because that depends on who's asking. The question is, how can we 
address the different values, the different motivations, the different desires of a diverse society and use that to inform the process of designing the research enterprise for the 21st century? How can we understand how the flows of knowledge are and are not working to different situations and different places under different circumstances? Chris Anderson, about 10 years ago now, wrote an article called The End of Theory, in which he said science was over because all we needed to do now is collect all the data and look for the correlations between things, and that would tell us what was going on. And in one sense, he was absolutely right. We have better access to answers than we have ever had before. The reason I've shifted from the sciences to the humanities is because it turns out answers are pretty easy once you've got a well-shaped question. It's the questions that are hard, and I think we need to hold ourselves to a much higher standard if we're going to deliver on the benefits and the opportunities to the whole of society that we've heard about this morning. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Very dangerous place, this. Thank you, Cameron. Is there any chance you see this happening somewhere out there, just to be a little bit optimistic? There are, there are small-scale examples of real success. Um, I think there are a range of funders that have had really interesting um, experiences bringing patients into grant panels. Um, that's been a challenging experience, but I think it's been a very positive experience in many cases. Um, I think there are um, certainly examples in the public engagement space um, where people are trying to work in this direction, and I think the best, um, the best work in research in public communication of research and scholarship, and again, that's a whole series of loaded terms um, there, um, has some examples of that. And then there are countries, I mean, we've heard Israel has its problems, but Israel is also a society where this sense of, of technology innovation really does arise and where there is, I think, a sense of, of greater interest and collaboration. Um, so there are pockets of success, and I think the thing that often links them together is small scale. So the economics of collective action tells us we should expect this to happen in small pockets. The question is, how can we create an environment in which the pocket over here and the pocket over there are actually supported by platforms or in a infrastructures or systems or ecosystems that help them align so that when they meet, their work is synergistic. And I think you know, that's the great tragedy of last Thursday, is that it's a political move towards essentially, you know, Britain wants different regulations, so it's different. Um, so this tension of top-down policy interoperability, um, what the Commissioner talked about with respect to creating collaborations between entrepreneurs and regulators, and I would say entrepreneurs and regulators and funders, um, is, a, is a really positive way forward. Really difficult to know how to make it scale up. Um, there are reasons to expect that to be very difficult. But I think it's a problem we have to address and have to try and solve. Um, and that's why <laughs> I'm you know, fundamentally a European, because it's, that's what, at its best, the European Union is about. It's about trying to find the common ground. We don't have to share all of our values, but we can have a conversation about what values we do share, and that's easier in a local context, and it gets harder as you go to bigger areas. And I don't, we're not yet at the level of maturity to do that globally, but we might be at the level of maturity to do it in a regional sense. Questions? Yeah? Could we have the microphone, please? So we heard from Thomas Inson that what's, what's really charged the salaries, there are lots of young people who want to contribute to develop, to develop a new system. They want to come to the university, they want to work there. We are not allowed to take people in at the university unless they're registered. If they start working, there's no insurance, if there's an accident and so on. We are missing out on a whole generation. They don't want to sign up as a PhD student because they want to make their own businesses. They don't want to do the patent system. So we are missing out by having simple 
systems which are not up to date. Yeah. What's your comment on these issues? And, and I skipped over a point I wanted to make, which is that the platform, the kind of platforms that support collaboration and innovation on, on a large scale, um, uh, they're technological platforms, they're social platforms, regulatory platforms, financial platforms. I thought it was really interesting the Commissioner talked about um, uh, financial instruments, actually, in VC funding. I would have answered the question to Tom differently. Um, so Tom was the question to Tom, you know, do we need to reconsider the design of the university? We absolutely have to consider a redesign of our research institutions. Um, we have to think about how we make them more open and porous um, to the outside world and to people who want to come in um, and be creative and innovative. Think about how they can be platforms for that. Um, that, as you say, it, it involves safety issues and regulatory issues and financial issues that are non-trivial to work through. Um, but there are, again, there are examples of creativity in maker spaces and things like that where some of these things are solved in small communities where there's trust on a small scale, again. So, you know, if I was to wave a wand, then I'd say the, the shift we should see is to thinking, is that research institutions particularly, universities in particular, have become quite corporatized, quite structured in ways that look like companies. And there are perfectly rational reasons for that, particularly in the latter part of the last century. I think the move we should see is one towards them as a collective of communities where there is less homogeneity created within an institution. There is more fluidity about where the boundaries are. Um, I'm really struck, um, I've blanked on the name, um, President of Arizona State University, um, Michael Crow, thank you, um, said this wonder, has this wonderful line which I really like. You know, Imagine if a university was not defined by how exclusive it is, but by how inclusive it is. I think that's a really powerful vision. It's not easy, it costs money, requires investment, requires rethinking the way we take responsibility for lots of things. Um, but that's a vision, I think, it's, it's a very powerful one. It costs money, but you get labour for free. But well, although to the point about Uber, there's some, there are concerns, I mean, I think there are, there are issues to be raised, and, I, and Jim also raised this, the questions about the role of labour and how that shifts when people are offering their time for free starts. I mean, maybe, maybe we should be talking about basic income. Maybe we should be talking about those kinds of things. But we've also got to figure out, it's very easy to design a utopian future. It's much harder to figure out how we get to a better place from here. Any question? If you were to take the first step, what would you say that would be? Would that be universities changing the quoting system? Would that be politicians redesigning education? First step, what would that be? So I think the first, the, the biggest, most powerful lever at the moment is um, with institutions, so with research institutions. And I say that having spent you know, the last decade of my life arguing with funders to impose open access and open data mandates. Funders have pretty much pushed radical change as far as they can at the moment, and there needs to be some time for the system to, to, to relax, in a sense. Um, institutions have a lot more freedom to move. Um, if institutions tomorrow said, we're going to consider a wider range of things in um, tenure and promotion cases, uh, we're going to look at a wider range of activities when we look at making new appointments. Um, we're going to think about how we can create more shared resources across the institution that are free to access for the academics um, across the institution. Those are the kinds of things I do, but the single, the single biggest thing to do is to make a public statement. I mean, single, simple, single thing an institution can do today is to sign up to the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment um, as a signal of a commitment to thinking in a more diverse way around research assessment and the promotion and tenure internally. That's a first step for you. Everybody, thank you, Cameron.